The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rainbow's continuing spring webinar series. This is Sean Burnick, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with everybody today on our topic, which is the management of Dutch elm disease, uh, which is one of the most destructive diseases of our industry. Um, pleasure to be speaking with you today. My background, just for those of you that don't know me, um, been in my uh, 17th year at Rainbow now. And background, I actually have undergraduate degrees in horticulture and agricultural education and uh, did my master's degree in plant pathology and actually worked with the USA Forest Service uh, for a couple of seasons doing research on a similar vascular wilt disease on shade trees called oak wilt. It uh, has a lot of the uh, same characteristics as Dutch elm disease, so I've got a lot of great experience uh, on both Dutch elm disease and oak wilt and managing it in urban areas. We'll be sharing a lot of those experiences with you today. A couple of housekeeping items before we start here. This webinar is worth one ISA CEU credit. And if you didn't enter your ISA certification number during the registration part of this, no big deal. You can actually just enter it into the questions box on your control panel on the side or top of your, your screen. Um, Furthermore, I want to answer as many questions as we can, and we'll save uh, five, 10 minutes at the end, specifically four questions. Uh, you can enter your questions in the questions box. And then Matt Karst, who is helping me manage the car conversation here today, uh, will read off those questions at the end, and we'll just address as many as we can. Also, the webinar is being recorded, so if you want to go back and listen to this yourself or share this with other people that might find value, in the industry and listening to this, please share that with them as well. A little bit of background on Rainbow Companies. Uh, Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements is the division within Rainbow Companies that was founded in 1997. And it's really our mission really is to advance the science and professionalism of tree care. And we do this by developing uh, predictable tree health care products and equipments and protocols that get predictable results. Uh, we have over 160 protocols that we train arborists on throughout the United States on a variety of different insect and disease management tools and protocols. And we have uh, people located throughout the U.S. who are always available to help provide uh, support for you as arborists out in the field to ensure that you're able to manage uh, the diseases, insects, abiotic problems that you deal with to serve your customers. <clears throat> Rainbow Scientific is uh, one division within our company. We also have Rainbow Tree Care, which was originally founded by Tom Prosser in uh, the late 1970s. Uh, there's Tom uh, in, in the 1980s uh, showing one of our original elm injection bands. And what's neat about our presentation today with Dutch elm disease management is that really saving and preserving elm is the cornerstone for rainbow companies and rainbow tree care. This is how Tom started the company back in the late 70s and early 80s as one of the largest Dutch elm disease epidemics was just ravaging the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin City area at the time. And Tom was really committed to preserving elm trees and finding a protocol that provided predictable results in managing and saving elms. Uh, over time, we added on more services, uh, traditional arboricultural services and other plant health care services, and we've grown today uh, to be one of the largest uh, tree care companies in the upper Great Lakes. The elm program at Rainbow, we treat 6,300 elms every three years. So in the Twin Cities, uh, there's still a, a large population of elms that we work with to preserve and save. Uh, we do that by using ArborTech and a macro infusion protocol, which we're gonna discuss in detail here in the presentation today. Um, and we do that at a very high success rate. When we follow the protocol for Dutch elm disease management, um, we are able to achieve a, a very high success rate in preserving elm trees over a three-year period. And Rainbow Tree Companies provides a money-back guarantee if for some reason we have a failure with any of the elms that Rainbow protects. 
And this program has been in existence, as I mentioned earlier, really at the onset of Rainbow. This is how we got our start and how Tom founded the company. And over the years, Tom evaluated many different treatment methodologies and products and really found that initially when he started working to treat and preserve elms, there wasn't a lot of support or training out there for arborist companies. And there was a lot of products that made claims that weren't backed by science. And so by working through trial and error and really working to evolve the modern day elm protocol, we've uh, developed where it is at today to really have an effective program for saving elms, not only in the local Twin Cities, but also uh, we take that training and support to the rest of the country with uh, the support of Arbor Tech and our equipment with other companies throughout the United States where ELMS are present. Today in the webinar, I've got uh, four takeaways that I would like to have everybody walk away with. Number one, understand what Dutch ELM disease is and why it's important to arborists. Understand the treatment protocol. Uh, specifically look at the fungicide uh, Arbor Tech and the macro infusion process and why we use that methodology and why it's the industry standard for L management. And then understand the common pitfalls associated with macro infusion treatments. So Dutch elm disease is a fungus uh, that grows in a water conducting tissue, the xylem of elm trees. Um, it kills native elms regardless of their health, their size, or any cultural practices that are being used to manage elms. It's really an equal opportunity killer when it comes to the native elms, especially the American elms, uh, as well as uh, red elm. Uh, this disease was first introduced in Cleveland, in Ohio, in 1930. It came in on a shipment of logs from France. And by 1970, Dutch elm disease had killed 77 million trees in the United States. So really ravaged our urban forests. Um, as we discuss, all native elms are susceptible and uh, the American elm and the red elm are highly susceptible. Our Asian varieties are more tolerant, although they are not uh, resistant to Dutch elm disease, they are more tolerant. So one of the issues that we had, we had lots of American elm lined streets uh, throughout many cities in the U.S. Uh, for good reason. This provided a great canopy. Um, it really provided a lot of uh, benefits to our urban uh, green areas. Uh, but we planted these as monocultures. So we planted one American elm uh, right down the median strip as shown here. And as we all know, diversity is, is required in our urban forests when we have these invasive pest species come in. Uh, really can change the um, the look and the feel of our urban landscape and with Dutch elm disease because it spreads from tree to tree via rickgrass or overland spread, uh, wiped out uh, these city streets uh, and these medians throughout the country in just a short period of time. Without attention, Dutch elm disease can really just wipe out an entire population of trees in, in really just a few years. And so this is a, an older picture here, but I think it shows kind of a, a good before and after of this uh, small property uh, in Minneapolis where the elm is the main shade tree on the property. And without that tree, it really, really makes a difference on uh, the shading, the cooling effects, and the, the value of that property. This map, I think, does a good job of illustrating the impact of Dutch elm disease, specifically on elms in Minneapolis from 1971 through the early 2000s. And this bar graph actually would, would be similar, maybe not in the exact scope and numbers if you look at other cities across the U.S., but we had a, a major Dutch elm disease epidemic that was ravaging a lot of parts of the country during the 70s. Um, and you can see in Minneapolis here, we lost over 30,000 trees alone in 1977. And you can see typically we lose a few thousand trees almost every year uh, in Minneapolis. We had a spike also in the early to mid 2000s in the Twin Cities as well with Dutch elm disease. Um, nothing as close to what we experienced in the 70s when Tom and Rainbow first started treating elms, but still 
a lot of elms that were were dying because of Dutch elm disease. Um, it's kind of an annual loss of of elms, and so our elm population throughout the United States continues to get depleted. Now, I think that that actually places a much higher value of the remaining elms, and strongly encouraging uh, communities, uh, municipal foresters, as well as commercial foresters to consider protecting and preserving the elms if they're in good condition uh, to, to save those elms. And I think with other invasive species that are impacting our urban forests, like emerald ash borer that's killing all of our native ash trees, I believe strongly that this place is much higher value on some of the other uh, shade tree species that we have, our elms and our oaks. And we should be looking at doing whatever we can to try to preserve these majestic trees. You'll find throughout parts of the country, there's still pockets of elms found throughout our communities. And I think there's um, a good opportunity uh, to, to work with your community uh, influencers to put programs together to, to manage the elms in these communities. And we'll talk about some of the case studies and how Rainbow has partnered with different communities and cities uh, and uh, stakeholders of large elm populations to preserve and save their elms. So there's two strains of the fung fungus uh, that causes Dutch elm disease. Ophiostoma is the genus. There's the omai species, and then there's the novo omai. Um, these are aggressive pathogens that kill trees regardless of their condition and health, as I had mentioned earlier. And they'll kill very small diameter trees up to the largest elms that are in the landscape. It's important to recognize that the fungus is growing in the current year. Here's xylem vessels, and the xylem is what's important for conducting water uh, in trees. And really what is occurring, we're seeing the symptoms of Dutch elm disease because the tree is actually producing tyloses, which are uh, the tree's response to the disease to try to plug up uh, and compartmentalize the disease. Um, and unfortunately, in so doing, the elm, elm tree blocks off its water conducting vessels as it's trying to compartmentalize the disease. And that's why oftentimes you'll see symptoms of flagging up higher in the tree initially that mimic uh, wilting symptoms. Dutch elm disease grows faster than the tree's ability to compartmentalize the fungus. So unfortunately, the tree can't keep up with the spread of the pathogen inside of the tree. If we look at symptoms of Dutch elm disease, uh, oftentimes as shown on the picture on the left here, we see what's called flagging at the terminal ends of uh, branches. And this will usually be way up at the top of our elm trees coming off of a main lead or a larger branch. And you'll see that initially, actually in the next few weeks, you'll start to see flagging uh, after elm trees uh, leaf out, a lot of times you'll see this flagging early on in late spring, early summer. And um, the leaves, the individual leaves will be yellow, uh, they'll be curled, and they'll droop, and eventually they will drop or defoliate. Um, and then on the picture on the right there, you can see as the symptoms kind of spread further uh, throughout the tree, the leaf symptoms up uh, in the canopy of the tree. Symptoms usually lag behind when the tree actually becomes infested uh, uh, by uh, four to six weeks after an infection occurs. Another uh, benchmark symptom with Dutch elm disease is that if you peel back that outer bark, you'll see brownish discoloration that's found underneath the bark, and that's the tyloses in that tree response that's occurring. You'll see, and you can see in this picture, the, the staining, that brownish dark color underneath the bark. And that really combined with the leaf symptoms is diagnostic for Dutch elm disease and a great way to identify it in the field as a uh, field diagnosis. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that the fungus is actually about five to 10 feet ahead of the staining symptom that you're seeing here. So as you travel down a branch, um, even where you don't have the staining, if you're within 10 feet or less, uh, there's a high likelihood that that fungus 
is in that area of the tree. Um, and so when you're taking samples, you want to sample as close as you can to the nearest leaf uh, uh, infected area to make sure that you, you're taking samples where you're going to uh, most likely see the staining. In an individual tree, uh, this is a, I think a good overview on how it spreads. So the infection starts up in the two to four year old branches, and this is due to where the uh, bark beetles are feeding. Uh, we'll talk about this in the life cycle, but Dutch elm disease spreads in two manners. Uh, one via uh, the native and elm bark beetle and European elm bark beetles. And the bark beetles are feeding in the two to four year old branches on elm trees. And so you'll see the symptoms beginning up uh, up in the uh, ends of the tree, in the terminal ends of the trees. Um, and then as the infection spreads, it's actually going to move down in narrow bands until it reaches the root system of the tree and then it's going to be uh, systemically moved and rapidly uh, transported throughout the remainder of the tree where it will uh, kill the tree very quickly. Uh, typically it can be just a few weeks or less once you start to see symptoms um, until that entire tree uh, is, is basically going to be totally uh, uh, symptomatic. Talking more about transmission, so I mentioned the two manners in which it's spread. One is via the European and the native elm bark beetle. So these are beetles that uh, feed on the branches and they have the fungal spores attached to them as they're, uh, and then it also spreads via root grafts. And uh, elms will oftentimes graft with one another. So as we saw the picture of the elm-laden street earlier on in the, in the, uh, in the presentation, uh, that made for just a perfect ripe ground for Dutch elm disease to spread from run, one tree to the next via these underground root grafts that uh, connect the root systems of adjacent elm trees. We look at overland transmission and the way that this works, a lot of times you'll have um, dead and dying elms that are going to harbor uh, these elm bark beetles and or people that will remove dead and dying elms and they don't do anything to remove the bark or cover those wood piles. Those be great, become great harborage sites for the elm bark beetles to basically feed and emerge and carry the Dutch elm disease fungus on their bodies into healthy trees. And again, they're going to be feeding up on those smaller two to four year old branches where they're going to spread that disease into a healthy tree. Um, and then basically that tree dies. Uh, bark beetles will feed on the dead or dying tree, move on to the next tree, um, and repeats the cycle over again. A couple key distinctions as it relates to the uh, life cycle of both the native and the European elm bark beetle. This is a illustration showing the peak months for when both of these species of bark beetles are out or emerging and flying um, and attacking elm trees. And this is important as it relates later on to management because if we um, we want to make sure that wherever possible, we can protect our elms with ArborTech prior to when these uh, bark beetles are feeding up in the tree. And I guess it speaks to the, the importance of the multi-year residual that we see with ArborTech. Um, because we treat our elm trees typically in late May, early June, after the elms have fully leafed out right about when they're dropping their, their seed pods. And because ArborTech provides multiple years of residual effectiveness, we actually can um, carry the ArborTech through the peak period of the native elm bark beetle, um, which is in April and May. Uh, whereas with annual treatments, where you're getting out in late May, June to make your injection treatments, you're actually missing a period of time when the native elm bark beetles are out flying and so your trees are, are unprotected. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. 
But note here that the native elm bark beetles are out earlier in the spring of the year, mid to late spring, and then the elm, the European elm bark beetle, they peak more in a uh, very early summer in June. And then there's also a spike in both populations in August and September. Um, excuse me, the, the, the highest population for the European is, is in the August, September months, but there's a good spike there in, in uh, May, June as well. So root graft transmission is the other way in which uh, Dutch elm disease is spread. Again, the fungus moves down the vascular systems uh, into the roots of the tree, uh, where it then spreads again back up, kills the tree very quickly, but then it also moves into adjacent trees through these root grafts, these interconnected uh, roots underground, um, and those become channels for the Dutch elm disease pathogen to move from a uh, infected tree to a healthy tree. So now I want to actually touch on uh, Dutch elm disease management. And really this takes into consideration over 40 years of operational experience, really working in the trenches to battle and manage Dutch elm disease, both locally in the Twin Cities as well as throughout the United States. And it takes into uh, consideration some of the peer-reviewed research that's been done over the years um, with different fungicide protocols. couple of case studies just to kind of demonstrate uh, how successful uh, the fungicide treatment protocol can be with Arbortech and macroinfusion. Uh, there is a city uh, north of Chicago called Evanston uh, that has a significant elm population in its city and the community there really rallied behind a few citizens who were sick and tired of just losing all of their elm trees. Uh, so in the early 2000s, uh, backed by some community activists and through support of Rainbow, we actually went and educated the city of Evanston and uh, worked with them to uh, implement a uh, elm preservation program. And the city has really had a great commitment to protecting its elm trees uh, over the past um, 15, 16 years. And to kind of illustrate the before and the after with Evanston, if you look at the city of Evanston, all of these red marks are dead elms that were marked during the periods of 2001 to 2003 throughout that city. Evanston then took on a uh, Dutch elm disease protection program and started treating their trees with Arbor Tech in 2005, and they treated the trees and have treated them every uh, three years. Um, and continuing through uh, the last three-year period of 2017. So the elms are under protection right now, but they treated them basically five times uh, since the early 2000s. Um, under treatment, they're experiencing less than a 1% loss rate. And I think it's important to also mention that in addition to the fungicide treatment program, they have a very intense scouting and removal programs so that they're out looking for Dutch elm disease. And if they see it, they're removing those trees uh, very quickly throughout the summer months. They have over 3,000 elms that they're treating, uh, the majority of with uh, by contractors, but they're also treating a smaller subset of elm trees with their own in-house crews as well. And so of the over 3,000 elms that are being protected. If you look at the periods of 2001 to 2003, they lost over 2,000 elms in the city. And since they've been uh, protected with uh, Arbor Tech and um, also since they've implemented their, their intense monitoring and removal practices, they've only lost 25 elms since the treatment program began in 2004. So I think a great success story. Um, and also I think one where a community really um, advocated for the preservation of their urban forests and working with their city officials and um, with the proper training with contractors and with Rainbow, it's a great success story in how those elms have been protected and preserved. 
Another one here locally in Minnesota is with the city of St. Louis Park. They have over 1,500 public and private elm trees that are on a three-year preventative rotation. And what's neat about this um, program um, is that uh, in, in the past, and I'm not sure if this is currently uh, being done today, I need to check with uh, Jim Vaughn, the city forester there, but there's a city reimbursement program that was in place for many years. And what was really cool, regardless of if it was a public or a private elm tree, homeowners were encouraged to protect their elm trees and then the city gave them a stipend to reimburse them for a portion of the cost of the treatment. So both the city as well as the homeowner had some skin in the game to protect their valuable elm trees. And uh, Arbortech has been the, the product that's being used within that treatment program as well. Another case study here at the Interlocking Country Club, which is in Edina, Minnesota. Uh, so 135 elms are treated preventatively here and really targeting many of the signature elms on the course. This golf course has a lot of beautiful elms, again, being treated on a three-year rotation. And I think to illustrate kind of the uh, long-lasting uh, impact that Arbor Tech has had on this course, we've been treating elms, uh, Rainbow Tree Service has for over 30 years to help beautify and preserve these elms um, uh, from Dutch elm disease. So a few case studies just kind of showing different scenarios and success stories. Um, and those are just a few of, of the many elms that are being treated across the United States with, with Arbor Tech. Um, here are the basic parts, I guess, of a sound Dutch elm disease management protocol. So if we're talking population-wide, a general population of elms, if you're looking at a community or even a, a golf course where you have a, a few hundred elms, it's important, as we talked about earlier, to have very intense scouting and sanitation practices. So you want to be out monitoring for disease trees uh, not only on your property, but looking for dead and dying elms and surrounding properties um, and promptly removing those trees. Um, one of the areas where you can get inoculum being harbored in a lot of cases is in what we call kind of scrub elms that are in ditches or in back alleys that maybe go unnoticed. Well, those serve as inoculum sources to propagate Dutch elm disease. And sometimes um, you need to not only scout your property, you have to scout adjacent properties as well. Um, and many cities, and this has been documented by Rich Hauer and, and a few others, that the more intense your monitoring practices and sanitation practices, meaning the, the more frequent that you scout your elm trees in a community, and the quicker you get uh, the dead and dying elms removed, the uh, the the uh, the higher likelihood or, or the the, the um, that will result in less elms dying each and every year, year if you have a more intense uh, sanitation and scouting program as part of your city. It's been pretty well documented. If we're looking at management of individual trees, um, it's important to recognize that um, we can protect uh, healthy asymptomatic trees with Arbortech fungicide that are not within root grafting distance of an infected tree. Um, so that's a key part of, of the protocol that we'll talk about. Um, and it's important also that where possible, we need to also sever the root grafts um, if we're dealing with an infected tree in a community or a population as well. We won't spend a lot of time on it today, but note that there is a process where if elm trees do show symptoms and we catch it early enough, we can go in and physically cut out the infected portions of um, Dutch elm disease in an individual tree. This is a very labor intensive process, but it can be done to actually trace out the fungal pathogen and um, make chainsaw cuts to trace it out and kind of create a uh, physical barrier, um, uh, not a physical barrier, but basically uh, cut the area of the xylem vessels where the disease is spreading. 
So severing rootgrass, it's important to know uh, where the fungus is in a tree before you install your rootgrass trench lines. Um, if the stain from the fungus is at the ground level, the fungus may already be in the roots of that individual tree, and it could already be in the root grass or roots of the adjacent healthy tree as well. So it's important that you know where the symptoms are and uh, you're able to predict where that staining is in the tree. Sometimes not only a primary trench line may be necessary, but also a secondary line as well to uh, create another uh, root graft barrier further distant away from that infected tree. Sometimes you almost have to, to uh, sacrifice uh, healthy trees and um, because of the high likelihood that even a healthy tree that's within root grafting distance, if that root graft barrier isn't placed there, it may have it already in its roots. So you may make, need to make another barrier more further out in a second line. <clears throat> Trench lines, really, they need to be three to five feet uh, deep into the soil. Five feet is better. This has kind of been documented with a lot of the oak wilt research that's been done by Texas A&M and others. Uh, while the majority of the roots are in the upper couple feet of soil, we know that roots will travel further and root grafts can be deeper into the soil. Um, so if we can make our trenches deeper, that's all the better. So the tracing process, just to speak to this real briefly, um, this is where we're going to follow the disease as, and that staining as it grows down the tree. And really the intent here is to isolate the disease inside parallel two inch deep chainsaw cuts. You can see the tree there. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've traced that longitudinally down the tree and then every a uh, couple of inches, we've made a horizontal cut um, that's two inches deep, again, to try to make sure that we can uh, basically cut off that xylem vessel where the fungus is going to be traveling down into the tree. Now, if the staining is within 10 feet of the ground, tracing isn't going to be effective because there is a very high probability that the pathogen is already in the roots of the elm tree and will spread systemically. Here's a picture uh, right after tracing. That's the same tree from the previous slide. And here it is six years later. So you can see that the tree is still living. It's recovered. It was successful. Um, but this is a very labor intensive process. But in some cases, um, if a homeowner is willing to do whatever possible and you think that you can catch that staining uh, prior to it becoming systemic in the entire tree, it might be worth the effort and the money to do that. And if you want to learn more about this, feel free to reach out to Rainbow and we can provide our full tracing protocol. So let's take a look now at uh, protecting elms with fungicide treatments. Uh, these are actually elms at Grant Park in Chicago that are being protected and it's just a beautiful park there with a lot of gorgeous majestic elm trees i'm so excited that they're uh, being preserved and, and protected on on the, the park there so there are a few different active ingredients that are registered by the u.s epa for dutch elm disease treatment and i just want to bring them to your attention so that um, as you're um, maybe coming up against competitive bids, there are companies out there that are recommending other treatments. And really, there's only uh, two active ingredients that can provide efficacy. And the, the caveat is that the research has shown the macro infusion method of ArborTech really to, is the industry standard. Uh, Dr. Dave French and Mark Stennis have, have proved that out um, in their fun, fungal inoculum uh, studies back at the University of Minnesota. There's been some good research showing that ArborTech lasts for up to three years in elms and provides a high level of protection. Propiconazole, uh, Alamo, and there's other generic propiconazoles on the market as well, can provide one year protection as a macro infusion treatment, but 
it doesn't provide more than one year of protection because it doesn't move into new wood. And then there really isn't any uh, research to show that microinjection treatments are effective against uh, Dutch elm disease. And there's another treatment that you may run into occasionally. Uh, Dutch trig is another one-year treatment. Um, but again, there, there haven't been any uh, fungal inoculum challenge studies that really support uh, I think the use of Dutch trig as being predictable for managing Dutch elm disease. So really Arbor Tech continues to kind of be the, the industry standard and the gold standard for elm treatments. One of the important parts about this, and you've, there's, over the years there's been product claims of their manufacturers having products that are effective against Dutch elm disease. And so what happens a lot of times, they'll go in and they'll treat city trees and make the claim that their treatments are effective against Dutch elm disease. And I think uh, one of the things you gotta look at and ask manufacturers is do they have challenge inoculation studies where they've actually inoculated the elm trees that they've treated with their various treatments where they have shown performance over time. That's extremely important, and I think that's what sets ArborTech apart uh, from the work that Dave French and Mark Stennis did to uh, uh, basically help in developing the initial uh, protocol with, with ArborTech. I do want to touch on just a key difference with macroinfusion versus uh, microinfusion. Uh, with macroinfusion, and this is a key distinction, the active ingredients are being diluted in large volumes of water. Uh, typically, you're talking about, um, with elms, 30 to 40, 50 gallons of water being injected into an individual tree. So you have a very low concentration of fungicide that's being delivered in a very high volume of water. And that's the opposite of microinjection treatments, where you're, you have a very highly concentrated um, solution or sometimes straight active ingredient going into the tree in very small amounts, typically just a few milliliters to a few ounces per inch. And when we're talking about the vascular wilt, like oak wilt and Dutch elm disease, um, there isn't a uh, really any research to support the use of these micro injections with Dutch elm disease, and there's only one or two studies uh, and limited data really to support them with oak wilt. Um, and the reason for that, when we're protecting these large elm trees, you need a high volume of water to thoroughly coat all of the xylem vessels throughout the canopy of a large elm tree. Um, and that's needed to get uniform, complete distribution of the ArborTech fungicide throughout the tree. Another key distinction is that we're targeting, we're making our injection sites on the root flare versus up on the trunk when we're making these applications. We'll talk about this a little bit later on during the uh, macroinfusion process as we get into the details with that. So ArborTech, uh, systemic fungicide used as a root flare injection. Uh, the active ingredient is thiobendazole. Um, one of the really neat properties about ArborTech is that if you make a treatment in 2019, it will actually transport into newly developed wood in 2020 and also 2021. So you get three years, up to three years of protection with this ArborTech fungicide. It's a unique molecule that way. As mentioned before, an average size elm tree is gonna require up to 30 gallons of water or more. So we get a lot of questions on why thiabendazole over propiconazole, why ArborTech over Alamo, uh, and actually Rainbow sells and supports and distributes both ArborTech and Alamo. And we've had this question over the years, why do we uh, support the use of ArborTech. Um, if you look at it, it really uh, has to do with that residual protection. Um, Dr. Stennis and French uh, determined that it moves into new wood when you use ArborTech each year, whereas with propiconazole, 
we only see one year of uh, protection, one growing season of protection. And that's been documented on Elms with uh, Jay Stipes and his work with Stephanie Armstrong. Uh, they found that the propiconazole only lasted seven months in the Elms that they treated um, as part of their trial, whereas Arbortec can last up to three years. So the propiconazole doesn't move into new wood. And that really forces the practitioner to make annual applications. And so not only are you not getting that uh, early spring coverage, uh, that carryover coverage from propiconazole, but you have to wound the tree three times as much as compared to ArborTech. And so ArborTech, because we get that multiple year residual, we can also minimize the wounding damage that's done from the tree injection treatment too. <clears throat> Again, when we look, go back and look at the, the bark beetle flight period, we see that both the European as well as the native elm bark beetles are flying in uh, late spring, early summer. If we don't get out and treat those trees annually with propiconazole, we're going to have unprotected elms and more failures. So to illustrate that, um, a couple of things. If you look at, um, I think the main point on this is just to look at a typical elm tree. If we are treating a mature elm 30 inches, uh, we recommend one and a half injection sites, 1.3 to 1.5 injection sites per inch of diameter. So on a 30 inch diameter tree, we're gonna have 45 injection sites in that tree. And it's important that we have that many to get the uniform uptake and distribution throughout the entire canopy. With ArborTech, we're treating that every three years. Um, and so in season one, you have 45 injection sites and we don't uh, retreat that until season four in this illustration. And then season seven, because we're, we're skipping uh, those two years in between. So over that nine year period, we're drilling about 135 drill holes when we use Arbor Tech. Um, whereas with the Alamo or the propiconazole, we're actually having to drill that tree every single year because it's not moving into the new wood again, resulting in 405 drill holes over that nine year period or 270 more holes over that nine year period with the propiconazole versus the ArborTech. And that also equates to a, a higher cost if you figure in all of your application costs, your product costs, uh, and things like that to retreat those trees annually. Um, in many cases, the homeowner is going to be paying more for those annual treatments if you figure out the cost of having to go out there every year instead of every three years. <clears throat> now, one thing I'll mention uh, about ArborTech too, as we get to latitudes, Philadelphia and south, some companies are treating uh, every two years with ArborTech, especially if they have very large trees or if disease pressure is extremely high. Uh, and you also have a, a longer growing season there. So in some parts of the country, uh, companies are treating every two years because they don't want to take any chances. We do know that ArborTech can wear off in the tree in season three. Um, and our system in more northern climates of the United States, as I mentioned before, uh, we can still see a very high level of control treating every three years, but note that in some cases, uh, some companies that are uh, further south in the United States are treating uh, every two years with ArborTech. Here's an illustration I think that really points to um, you know, some of these annual treatments and the risk of not having your elms protected in those carryover years. Um, again, ArborTech treated in year one, you're going to have full protection into year two, um, and then year three throughout the spring. Uh, whereas Alamo, you got to treat it each year. And you typically, with macro infusion, to get optimal uptake and distribution, you're going to be waiting until those elms are fully leafed out. 
And so that leaves a couple of months of susceptible time for Dutch elm disease to be spread into unprotected trees uh, with the, uh, the bark beetles. <clears throat> And then we also see uh, even even more so with Dutch trig, which recommends a little bit later application each year into the growing season. So some of the drawbacks of those annual treatments uh, versus Arbor Tech. So now let's get into the macro infusion process itself. Uh, here's the steps to doing macro infusion. So we first inspect the tree, we excavate the root flare, drill it, insert the T's, um, begin the infusion process, mix up our Arbor Tech, uh, monitor and then clean up. We'll go through these steps here in a little bit more detail in the next few minutes. So extremely important that we inspect the elm trees thoroughly for disease, both the tree that you're treating and we also look at all of the surrounding adjacent elm trees. Number one, Arbor Tech will not be effective on any trees showing symptoms. And furthermore, it doesn't prevent root graft spread. So if you have a healthy elm that's within root grafting distance of an infected elm, uh, that elm will also be at, the Arbor Tech is not going to be effective in preventing that. Um, it may mask the symptoms on a healthy elm that's root grafted to an infected tree for the treatment period. But as the Arbor Tech wears off, typically what we see is that fungus will travel into the tree and uh, infect the tree and show symptoms once the Arbor Tech wears off inside of the tree. So it's very important to inspect the tree. You also wanna look for signs of decay anywhere near the root flare area that you wanna avoid during the macro infusion process. Um, and you wanna avoid treating those areas. You also want to identify the species of the tree correctly. Um, and this is extremely important because an American elm uh, is going to get the full 2.4 ounces of Arbor Tech per inch. That's the, the highest label rate. Red elms will actually get half that rate. So 1.2 ounces per inch of diameter of Arbor Tech. Um, and if you apply too much Arbor Tech on red elms, they'll actually show leaf phytotoxicity and can get some premature leaf drop. It's not going to kill the trees, but you can get some significant defoliation. Um, and if that happens, you need to thoroughly water that tree throughout the summer months to help promote uh, growth. Um, oftentimes you see that lower in the, the canopy on the red elms. Occasionally you can see it on American elms, but not, not to the severity that we see it with the red elms. Again, it doesn't kill the tree, but it's something that can definitely aesthetically um, impact the tree. And if, if the homeowner is not expecting it, it can be an expectation issue. So first thing is to excavate and clean the root flares. Uh, so we're targeting the root flares um, because they're great sites for uptake distribution. They also compartmentalize wounds uh, much better. They callus over uh, much more quickly. The root flare is actually growing at about one and a half times the rate of the trunk. And um, there's just a lot of great surface area in the root flare for placing the injection sites. And we're gonna target the, uh, the root flare four to eight inches below the top of the root flare. And off, and most of the time we're also excavating so that we can get below soil grade because you don't have bark that's produced on the root flares below the soil. So it can make seeding your teas consistently a much easier task than trying to push them through thicker bark. Typically remove the, the sod with a shovel or some type of a, um, a hand trowel very delicately without damaging any of the root flares. Here's a great picture from Dr. Tom Smiley on the sapwood of the tree. You can see as compared to the trunk, there's just a lot more uh, great area for injection sites uh, because there's more surface area of uh, active xylem tissue that you can place your injection sites in. We're then going to take a brush and brush off the root flares so there's no soil or grit that will impact um, um, It'll get clogged up in, in the T's and or dull your drill bit. 
We'll then drill our holes. And this is important to um, basically take your drill and drill a nice clean surgical cut. So you wanna get that drill uh, bit going at full speed before you uh, stick it into the root flares of the tree and then create a nice um, surgeon-like cut in a quick clean continuous motion. And then you wanna drill perpendicular to slightly angled on the root flares of the tree. Sharp drill bits, can't stress this enough. You wanna use sharp high helix drill bits. Um, yes, they cost a little bit more money, but in the long run, you're going to increase the uptake speed of Arbor Tech as it goes into the tree because you're creating a nice clean surface area with, with uh, and you're, you're exposing as much uh, of the open xylem vessel uh, as you can with the drill bit versus cauterizing the tissue. We recommend actually replacing the drill bits every five to 10 trees that you inject. Um, it's important to place the injection tees to the appropriate depth. You don't want to jam them past the outer um, outer uh, sapwood, that annual, that first layer of annual growth. That's where all of the uptake is occurring with the Arbor Tech. So we're drilling typically about three quarters to an inch into the root flare so that we can deliver the Arbor Tech solution into the active xylem. Here you can see a properly inserted tee. Uh, the T has the nice taper in it, so you, you drill in to the appropriate depth, and then the Arbortex solution is allowed then to uh, move into the outer xylem vessel. As mentioned earlier, we're actually targeting about 1.3 to 1.5 injection sites for every inch of DBH, and we want to place those sites uh, about four to six inches apart on the root flares around the tree. You want to avoid any of the valleys or the in-between areas. Oftentimes you can get decay and real punky growth in there. Those aren't great sites for, for placing your injection tees. It's important that you, you check the tees to make sure that they're not blocked or plugged with any dirt or grit. Um, and then you want to lightly insert the tees. You don't want to push them too deep. And then just give them a real light tap with a uh, soft uh, mallet hammer. If you do get any blocking of the tees, you can use a uh, just a, a you know a, a paper clip to to block to remove any blockage in them. There you can see placing the tees into the root flare, and then starting the infusion, you want to actually start with water. Add your water in and, and get all of the harness filled with water. You're gonna pull two tees out in opposite locations to purge the air out of the harness system and to get the water moving freely through all of the harness. It's gonna result in uh, even pressure and, and also even uh, just making sure that there's no air bubbles blocking any of the movement of the Arbor Tech solution throughout the tree, throughout the harness, excuse me. Turn on the pump and bleed the air. There's two different pump systems. There's a 12 volt system that you can uh, use, uh, typically a car battery type system that would plug into your pumps, or you can use just a 115 volt system that would plug into an electrical outlet on the side of someone's home. So once you've purged the air, you reinsert the two T's that you pulled out. You make sure that your pump is set at about 15 PSI, 15 to 20 PSI. And then you mix in your Arbor Tech at the appropriate rate. Again, 2.4 ounces of Arbor Tech per inch for the American elms. And then you reduce that rate in half for red elms. I'd say probably about 95% of the elms that we treat are American elms, but occasionally we run into some, some really nice red elms out there that are treated as well. One key point about Arbor Tech is that it does not mix well with high pH water. So if you know that you run into high pH water, there's two things that you can do. Some companies will um, run all of their water through a deionizing tank, and you can get these from Culligan. Some people have them right on their, their vans or their trucks. They make little smaller deionizing systems as well that you can use. Um, so that's one way that you can um, um, uh, 
improve the water quality. Uh, the other way is that uh, by purchasing some muriatic acid. This is sold in a lot of different hardware stores, typically for cleaning up uh, pools. Um, you can find this, and you can mix that at the rate of one ounce of muriatic uh, acid per six gallons of your ArborTech water solution, and that will help to acidify uh, the uh, fungicide mixture. And so what you're going to do as you mix in your ArborTech with the water, you actually want to take out a sample every maybe 10, 15, initially, and then every 10 to 15 minutes. And as you hold that sample up to the light in your mixing container, you want to make sure that there's no white flakes or sediment that is occurring. The ArborTech is white as it precipitates out. So if you see that white precipitate, you know that you have uh, too high pH water or too hard of water. So you need to mitigate that with a deionizer or with the muriatic acid. Maintain the pressure at 15 to 20 PSI throughout. Um, and at that point, your crew should begin putting away their equipment and just checking any T's for leaks. Uh, typically, on average, to move that massive amount of water into elms, it's going to take about 60 minutes. And we'll have companies that will call us that we'll do training with. They'll talk to us, hey, it's taking us three, four, six, eight hours to inject this elm tree. Well, there's something that's gone awry in the injection process. And so we've created uh, the following kind of pitfalls to address during the macro infusion process. And usually through our training, we can find that it's one of these issues uh, that is uh, actually causing your uptake times to be so slow. And so keep in mind these pitfalls and you want to address each of them uh, within your training. And, and Rainbow has our territory managers throughout the country. One of the things that they're doing right now with many companies is going out and training their technicians, whether it's a refresher training or they're training their new technicians, that's something that they do. So here's the pitfalls. Use a sharp drill bit. Change that drill bit every five to 10 trees. Uh, make sure that you're drilling correctly. You're getting that drill bit to full speed before you plunge it into the root flares. You're not spinning the drill bit in the hole, cauterizing that xylem tissue. Again, a clean surgical cut. Target the root flares. The root flares is where your injection sites need to be to get uniform uptake and distribution and to ensure um, that you get rapid uptake. You may not have enough injection sites, so the T's are not spaced evenly throughout the tree. That's going to result in non-uniform distribution and, and slower uptake in some cases as well, especially some companies try to shortcut the number of T's required. If you pound those T's in too far, you're gonna be missing that current year of xylem, that active xylem tissue that's, that's transporting all the ArborTech fungicide solution up into the tree. You may have clogged T's. Unequal pressure inside the harness is another, another aspect of it as well. I want to put a little plug out there for uh, ISA's best management practices for tree injection. Uh, this is something that about 20 of us, uh, both in academia and in the industry, wrote that really covers off on a lot of the key points that we talked about, uh, not only for doing macro infusion, but also for any tree injection process. And so that's something that you can purchase just for uh, 12 bucks or so by going onto ISA's website. And that's available to you in the industry. It's a great tool for training and, and teaching crews and going through some of the different application processes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, seek out Rainbow for in the field training. Uh, we also have tips and guides that you can uh, get from us. We have this really neat one here on ArborTech that lists out the rates um, and then also has a quick guide on those uh, macro infusion pitfalls that we talked about as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your uh, attention today and your time spent with Rainbow. Um, and Matt will take a few questions uh, for those folks that want to stay on that had put any questions into the chat box. Um, and we do have an upcoming webinar in June on spotted lanternfly, which is the next destructive invasive species that us as arborists are dealing with, um, especially right now out in the mid-Atlantic area of the country. So thank you again.
All right, thanks, John. So we'll jump right into the questions here. Uh, first one is, uh, is the good Dutch elm disease management protocol more applicable to commercial areas? Uh, they found that residentially speaking, it's hard enough to get homeowners to treat their elms uh, with how expensive it is, let alone spend man hours scouting every two weeks only to have other homeowners not allow us sanitation treatment. Yeah, I actually think it's applicable to both residential and commercial settings where you're dealing, or communities, cities, where you have high value elm trees. So when it comes down to should you treat an elm, it's really what's the value of that elm to the property owner versus the cost um, required to treatment treat that tree over time. And it's, it's a long, you've got to be in it for the long haul. Um, as far as the sanitation and um, you know the scouting, yes, if you have two property owners, maybe two residential sites that are adjacent to one another, it's important that you really rally your neighbors to also encourage them to manage their elms as well. And we've had instances where I know neighbors will treat their neighbor's elm tree so that it doesn't become infected because the value of their tree is, is so much. Um, it does take a community effort, and I would say for cities, the sanitation, the scouting is one of the key parts of having a real high-level elm management program if you're looking to save trees kind of citywide. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, the next one is in reference to the six-year-later tracing slide. Uh, how did you know to start there, and did you start tracing higher first? Um, so what you do is you go in and you actually need to identify where the, the staining is at by cutting out uh, small windows in the bark where you can observe staining or the lack of staining. So you start at the symptoms and then you go down uh, five to ten feet to make your first cutout. Uh, if you know that um, the tissue is clean there, uh, based on what we know about Dutch elm disease and how the symptomology works, typically where you see symptoms on the tree, leaf and staining, the fungus is five to 10 feet in advance of that. So you want to start somewhere in that area and start observing for staining and then start making your, your longitudinal cuts somewhere in that area. All right, I think that does it for questions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, don't worry about the CEUs, we'll take care of that on our end. Uh, if we got your uh, ISA certification number, we'll send that into ISA and you should see that uh, go on in about four to six weeks, I think is their, their time on that. Um, otherwise with that, I'll say have a great day and thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks everybody.